Greetings from the National Archives flagship building in Washington, D.C., which sits on the ancestral lands of the Nacotchtank peoples. I'm David Ferriero, archivist of the United States, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's virtual author lecture by Robert M. Smith, author of Suppressed. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you about two upcoming programs you can view on our YouTube channel. On Monday, May 10th at 5 p.m., Bob Drury and Tom Clavin will tell us about the true saga of Daniel Boone and the conquest of the frontier, the subject of their new book, Blood and Treasure. And on Thursday, May 13th at noon, historian Jonathan Zimmerman and Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist Signa Wilkinson will present their new book, Free Speech. This brief but bracing book tells the story of free speech in America and makes the case for why we should care about it today. For more than 120 years, the New York Times has proclaimed that it publishes all the news that's fit to print. At some point, someone is deciding what is fit to print, and the results of those decisions are the subject of our featured book, Suppressed. Robert M. Smith spent years as a reporter with the Times, and in his new book, he examines how some stories make it to print, how some do not, and how the filters work. The First Amendment to the Constitution declares that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. With that freedom comes responsibility, and this book reminds us that news outlets approach that responsibility in different ways. Robert M. Smith is a former New York Times White House and investigative correspondent who was witness to some of the most important stories in modern history, including Watergate, the Pentagon Papers, the My Lai Massacre, he began at the Times in his 20s, quit, went to Yale Law School, and was rehired by the Times. He became a lawyer in a prestigious firm, served in the administration of President Jimmy Carter, and worked as an international commercial mediator in England and in the United States. He won an award for news writing from the United Press International, won several awards while at the New York Times, and has written a comprehensive legal treatise on mediation and arbitration. Now let's hear from Robert M. Smith. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Eric Fox, and I am speaking today with Robert M. Smith, author of the soon-to-be-released Suppressed Confessions of a Former New York Times Washington Correspondent. Bob is a graduate of Harvard College, and he has advanced degrees in foreign affairs from Columbia, the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism, and Yale Law School. He has had a wide-ranging career which includes journalism, the law, both in the United States and England, and serving in the Jimmy Carter presidency. Bob received many accolades as a journalist and as a lawyer, preparing a case for the world court and serving as a mediator for multinational corporations. Bob, you've written a lot in your career and now you're publishing a book whose central theme is the First Amendment and the role of the press. What do you think is the most important lesson from your book? I think that the most important lesson is that in a time of a badly, totally divided country, the normal role of the press uh, is to be able to show folks on the right uh, what those on the left are like and thinking and so on and vice versa, and playing a role perhaps in, in having them understand one another and knitting the two together. That's not possible now because uh, the press is not trusted by a very large part of the population. Uh, advocacy journalism has to some extent replaced neutral journalism and people don't trust the press, which means the press cannot help uh, st stitch the country back together, so to speak. Your book starts with a critical moment in American history, the lead up to the Watergate investigation. What happened when you were an investigative reporter in the Washington Bureau of the New York Times and met with the director of the FBI? Something quite remarkable happened, and it's still stupefying to me. Uh, the day before I was to leave the Bureau and go to uh, Yale Law School, uh, I had lunch with the then acting director of the FBI. We had lunch at a French restaurant and uh, sat at a table. And he told me uh, about Watergate and some of its participants. Um, and I was uh, incredulous. 
I couldn't take my notebook out because here we were in a crowded Washington uh, restaurant at lunchtime. And so I sat there trying to remember the names. He gave me Segretti's name, for example, and I used the mnemonic uh, spaghetti, spaghetti Segretti. Anyway, he, he told me uh, this uh, story uh, to some extent with detail. And uh, I, after the lunch, uh, I knew it was my last day. I cornered the, <coughs> excuse me, editor, news editor of the Washington Bureau of the Times and uh, and ask him to go to his office, shut the door there, put up a scotch taped uh, a sign that said, do not disturb, turn on a small tape recorder, gave him a, a, one of the reporter's uh, pads and, and uh, pen and uh, asked him to take notes, which he did. And I told him about what had just happened and gave him what uh, the FBI had about Watergate. And uh, then at the end of <clears throat> my briefing or debriefing, uh, we left the room and I went to my desk to finish packing up and he went into the newsroom. Now the newsroom had, I don't remember exactly, but 30, say 35 um, really good reporters. And I went off to New Haven and read the paper and saw nothing, nothing. Uh, and I didn't understand what was happening. And then a few months later, uh, the Times began getting very badly beaten by Woodward and Bernstein. Um, and I, I was just uh, amazed. And subsequently, I asked the editor uh, years later uh, what had happened. And he said he had no explanation. I said that essentially that's not credible. And he said, uh, well, we were going off, my wife and I, on an Alaskan cruise. And I said, that cruise wasn't for a week. I mean, for goodness sake, in journalism, uh, a week is uh, a vast amount of time. Uh, you had plenty of time. So what really happened? He said, I don't know. Do you want me to take truth serum? And uh, I said, if it would help, yes. <laughs> How do you address claims that the media has always been biased? Well, it depends, I suppose, on what you mean by biased, but there are degrees of bias, just as at law school we learned. There are degrees of evidence or evidentiary solidity. Some things are more solid than others. This, this table here next to me is quite solid. Uh, the jurors could see it, the judge could see it. Uh, rainbow is uh, somewhat more ethereal, and uh, some may see it and some not, I suppose. But in any event, um, there are degrees of objectivity. No one, I think, would, no one in, in the newspaper business or craft would argue that reporters and editors are without their own personal political views or partisan bias. Uh, and that's true. But that doesn't mean that they inject it into their stories. So at some institutions, Premier among them, probably the New York Times, which has said, and still says in house ads, it runs in the paper, uh, that it is uh, telling the truth. Well, you know, again, of course, putting aside the relativity of the truth or different versions of the truth, that is absolutely not what happened with regard to the Times and the Trump administration or, or the Times on other topics now. And I, I think any fair-minded reader knows this. And certainly uh, President Trump felt correctly he wasn't getting a fair shake. And the Times correctly said it wasn't getting a fair shake from him. They were both right in a, in a sense. But the Times stepped into the ring and began punching it out or slugging it out with the president. That wasn't the role of the press. And it had one really, quite apart from principles, one really awful effect. If you're in there slugging it out with the person you're writing about, the president, then people are not going to find you credible. After all, you're in the ring. And that uh, has had the effect I, I mentioned earlier. And that is so far, to answer your question, from any view of journalistic neutrality that I don't think one needs to say a lot more about it. 
What other evidence can you point to in terms of bias and how do you compare the Times to other news organizations? Well, you know, when I showed up on the doorstep of the New York Times, I was uh, very young. I was in my mid, late 20s and uh, naive, I suppose. But I saw other examples. They're in the book. Uh, They're laid out. You know, the Times coverage of uh, President, then President Trump um, is compared in the book in detail with coverage by the Associated Press, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the Associated Press is hundreds, probably thousands of uh, client media outlets around the world, some left, some right, some in the middle. So um, it doesn't want to lose clients. It does play the news down the center. Um, and give, a, a, I think, a quite objective view. And that is uh, not uh, what is uh, occurring uh, uh, generally. Um, in my stay at the Times, uh, one of my first assignments when I was, I don't know, 27 or something like that, um, I was sent back to Harvard uh, College where I myself got to college. Uh, which is probably why they sent me. And I mean, because I knew the place. And uh, there were riots by the students at Harvard, all right? There were these big riots. And uh, I was there to cover the riots and I wanted very badly, everybody in the media wanted very badly to have uh, an interview with the president of Harvard, Nathan Pusey. And uh, uh, President Pusey wasn't seeing anybody, no one uh, in the media. Well, one day I happened to be in Harvard Yard and uh, the, the, where the administration is and, and, and freshman dormitories and so on. And um, I saw President Pusey walking across the yard. So I went over to him and I was holding my notebook. I identified myself as a Times reporter and I asked him questions and he gave me answers to my surprise. I hurriedly wrote a story and filed it and was very proud of myself that here I was, young reporter, I'd gotten this interview, which no one else had been able to get. Around, uh, well, I don't know, late afternoon, four o'clock, five o'clock, whatever, I got a call from God, that is to say, Scotty Reston, a journalistic icon of great uh, magnitude and importance, who was, I think, then running the paper. And he said, uh, hello, Bob. Um, So I've been looking at the interview of President Pusey, um, and uh, don't you think uh, we ought to uh, uh, pass on this one? I don't think we were a bit hard with him. I I said, I have no idea what you're talking about, Scotty. Uh, No, I don't think we were hard on him. I, I told him I was a Times reporter. I had my notebook out. I asked him absolutely normal questions. He gave me answers, which were not earth-shaking answers, uh, but um, uh, he did give substantive answers, and they were, it was the first interview that, um, that uh, he had given to anybody, Uh, and, uh, and Reston said, um, well, uh, don't you think he's under a lot of pressure, under a lot of stress? Um, and I said, yes, he is. He said, well, why don't we just uh, let this one pass? And so my story, one of my first, I suppose, in the sense uh, at the Times was spiked. That is to say, it never got to see the light of day for this reason. Um, and there were many or several other uh, episodes like this where stories were killed or not covered or whatever, which are also uh, laid out in the book. For example, I covered the My Lai Massacre and the Pentagon reporter who sat next to me in the Washington Bureau of the Times would not cover the the massacre at all until finally uh, near the very end of the story, the Pentagon decided to have a news conference. And then for the first time, he wrote about that, that is the Army's view of uh, the massacre. Or 
I covered uh, a story about problem banks, this list of problem banks, and the government uh, thought these banks were problem banks. I think it was the control of the currency. And uh, I did a story. Well, the financial business financial reporters at the paper wouldn't touch the story. Or finally, just to give you just one of a series of examples, another one, um, I um, uh, had uh, leaked to me, I, as I recall, a, a letter from uh, a Lockheed, a lawyer from Lockheed who was writing on hotel stationery from Geneva, Switzerland, or somewhere in Switzerland, uh, talking about the bribes he was paying to co-warded recipients and talking about how he had to pay more to compete with the Italians and the French or whatever it was. And it was a short uh, piece because his, what, he, what he had written spoke for itself with references to code words, code books, uh, antelope and things like that, code words. And uh, he, at, the, at the end, it was rather funny because he said, I, I asked uh, the bribe intermediary essentially why he trusted me and, and the fellow said, because you're a lawyer. So I thought it was uh, uh, sort of an important piece at a time when overseas uh, bribery was being featured uh, and investigated in uh, Congress and the Senate. And I filed it and the business and financial pages didn't run it. I got so upset that they weren't running it that I took the piece and submitted it to the Sunday Week in Review, where I was a frequent contributor at the time, and the Week in Review ran. And then the following day, Monday, <clears throat> an editor from the in the Washington Bureau came over to me and said, Bob, the editor of Biz Fin, Business Financial, has called and asked why you gave this piece to the Sunday Week in Review and not to uh, the business section. And I opened a drawer in my desk and show him the, showed him the uh, duplicates, the carbons of the story that I had sent to Business Financial. So I hope that gives you a sense of what I'm talking about and what I lived through. Your book is not afraid of exploring topics where neutrality is often hard to find. You've mentioned uh, the Trump presidency uh, and your viewpoint on the media's uh, treatment. What shapes your own uh, mindset in politics? Well, I'm not going to go into, uh, frankly, my own politics, uh, although I don't think they're any secret. I mean, I, I, my view from uh, my perspective is irrelevant, as it should be uh, in the case of uh, reporters covering the White House or, or anywhere else. But it's no secret that I served um, as special assistant to the attorney general under President Carter. So uh, one can imagine what my politics at least were. Um, but I do think that's uh, not relevant. And the whole point I'm trying to make is it ought not to be relevant. I lived in France for a while. And uh, in France, uh, in the small town I lived in, I had to read three uh, newspapers just to find out what was happening because of this uh, partisan or ideological partiality. I read uh, Le Monde for the uh, conservative right-wing view. I read, uh, I'm sorry, for the left or uh, liberal view. Uh, Le Figaro for the right-wing or uh, conservative point of view. And then once a week, I would read a, a publication called Canal Enchaîné, which is a terrific investigative reporter with all kinds of sources in the French government. Well, we've kind of reached that stage here. Now, uh, you have to watch, I, I gather, uh, MSNBC and Fox and so on to get some sense of where the truth might lie. What were the harder stories for you to cover? The ones that involved investigating those in power that had something to hide or the ones dealing with the lives of otherwise ordinary citizens? Clearly, Eric, uh, ordinary citizens, I, you know, the, the stories that really made me personally mm, extraordinarily sad were covering the shooting of the students at Kent State, 
or covering uh, integration with, with school buses, bringing, uh, I don't know, five or six or seven year olds into South Boston, where the South Boston uh, uh, mothers, the Irish American mothers there were screaming at these children. And, uh, it's just a terrible sight to see. Or to take one other example, uh, um, Harlan, photographer in his 80s, <clears throat> sitting on the stoop of the house, the brownstone in Harlem, <clears throat> sorry, from which he was being evicted. And all of his negatives, photos, glass sides, going back 50 years, were being loaded by sheriffs, New York City sheriffs, on um, trucks. Uh, to be taken heaven knows where. I mean, uh, these things are really uh, obviously very troublesome. Put yourself in the shoes of the reporter covering them. They're much harder on you, I think, than being at the White House and covering uh, Nixon saying something about foreign policy. You were a commended journalist in one of the most prestigious news organizations in the world and working in its Washington bureau, no less. Why did you leave journalism for law school and why did you return to the Times after law school? That's a complicated question. I'm not sure I, I'm the best person to answer it, but Eric, um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, I think I may have, in all fairness, Pete too soon. I think it was a combination of factors. You know, I, here I was in the Washington Bureau of the New York Times, which at the time was the, um, uh, in some ways, the pinnacle of, of Washington journalism, I suppose. And uh, I was quite young when I was covering uh, the White House and, uh, and the State Department and the Pentagon and so on. So I think if I hadn't uh, been able to do that until I was in my late 30s or early 40s or mid 40s, I might not have left. Secondly, I had always um, some feeling that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And thirdly, chance. You know, I applied to only one law school, uh, to be honest, uh, to Yale. And I took all the tests and uh, gave them my transcripts and uh, all the usual drill. And uh, I thought that they probably wouldn't take me. And if they didn't, I would say at the paper. But they did take me. And I went to Yale and I found that school, particularly the first year, a remarkable intellectual experience. I'm not even, I'm not an intellectual, but the experience of uh, the way in which the things could be analyzed was uh, amazing and made me certainly want uh, to finish uh, law school and ultimately uh, to be a lawyer. And then for the last, uh, I don't know, 29 years or so, to be a, a mediator, a commercial mediator. Have your post-journalism careers helped shape your viewpoint on journalism or your career in journalism? And is there a thread between your varied careers? Well, again, Eric, I, I'm not sure. I think so. I think, you know, uh, Luce, uh, uh, the founder of Time Magazine, um, said that journalism prepares you for everything, which I think is true, it does. Uh, it has a extremely ground level uh, practical uh, education involved in it. Uh, so I, I, I think that's true. In terms of law, it certainly changed the way in which I at least analyzed uh, life and uh, events. And um, mediation, I just found, uh, was, uh, in my mind, remains a better way of solving uh, conflicts than uh, slugging out in a courtroom with a jury or, or, or a judge. Uh, and I think the thread among them is that some of the skill sets are uh, involved in all of them. I mean, in journalism, uh, you have to be believed. Your sources have to find you credible, honest, and willing to keep their confidences, even if it means you go to jail. And that's a high standard of trust to gain. Uh, in uh, law, if you're a trial lawyer, as I was, um, you have to convince the jurors that even though you're an advocate, they should listen to you and believe you, certainly as to those things that 
uh, seem credible. And I always told jurors I was an advocate, which is true. And finally, in mediation, you have to absolutely have the trust of the parties and the lawyers too, but, but mainly, I suppose, the parties in the dispute. I mean, I've been a mediator in the United States and in England, where I'm also a barrister. Um, and so I've had different cultural experiences. I've mediated uh, cases uh, in the German language, for example, and in French. Uh, the bottom line is that there is there are some skills that are uh, similar in all three areas. And I have been fortunate in being able to bring, I hope, some of those skills from one uh, craft to another. You once prepared a case before the world court. Can you share some of that experience? <laughs> now, <laughs> I'll show you uh, the government in action, bureaucracy in action, and how these things really look from behind the curtain. This is in the book. This is big, uh, it's one of my favorite, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, episodes because <laughs> um, it was my idea. This is this was during the period when the Iranians were holding hostage uh, Americans, you would call, perhaps, and uh, <laughs> we were going the United States. That is, that is, when I was uh, special assistant to the attorney general, uh, to the World Court in the Hague to ask uh, the World Court to say, tell the Iranians to give us the hostages, let the hostages go. So I thought this was something uh, for the Attorney General, not for the State Department legal office. <clears throat> and the State, uh, the, the Attorney General is supposed to represent the United States in all courts everywhere. But in any event, the uh, the matter had already reached the point where the State Department had prepared the brief and, and so on. But the White House agreed with me and we were to toot off uh, the very next day to uh, Holland and to get into the World Court, the Attorney General would uh, pr would present uh, to the World Court the um, case. Well, we got on the, the plane, and I looked at the brief, and all oh, all oh, modesty aside, all kidding aside, the brief was a, a good legal brief, but this was not meant really for legal consumption only or mainly. This was an exercise in public international diplomacy. And in a way, it was like journalism. Uh, in a way, it was like trial law, you know. And the brief was very dull, or at least I, I found it so, uh, you know, filled with legal references and legal languages. And I, I didn't think the way this should be approached, this matter should be approached. So I rewrote the brief. I stayed up all night on the plane surviving with the kind help of the KLM stewardesses uh, on Dutch cocoa, right? And uh, rewrote the brief. And I knew that we needed some sort of sound bite or some, something that would capture att media attention, international media attention. And uh, I came up with, as the lead, the, the beginning of the brief, let my people go. Uh, which is in both the uh, Islamic and uh, and Christian and uh, Jewish uh, religions. Um, so uh, that's the way that the brief started and the attorney general started in the court. So I arrived, or we all arrived, in Holland, and I had to get the brief retyped since it was rewritten. And I went to a secretary in the embassy uh, around noon, and said, uh, can you please type this right away because the attorney general is going to be giving the brief in a couple of hours in the world court. And she looked at me and said, well, you know, it's lunchtime. <laughs> I, I didn't, I was so tired and so staggered. I, I went to the, whoever, the highest person I could find in the embassy and said, can you please help me get this typed? And we did and went to the uh, world court uh, where by that time I had a splitting headache from not having slept and so on and so on. And a very kind bailiff gave me some white powder and in, in, in like a tea and, a, and hot water for the headache. Um, and it, it did its uh, work, but it was, uh, it was some pain involved in being under massive 
amount of lights as as this argument unfolded, but the notion that we almost fail for, uh, in my mind, at least a variety of reasons, including a, a secretary who simply wanted to go to lunch, was uh, somewhat revelatory and and funny. You were negotiating with the New York Times as part of the union, and something shocking happened. What was it? Well, the Times had offered me a few jobs when uh, I went back to work for it after law school. And uh, one was running a subsidiary publication and so on. One was being the Times labor negotiator. I turned it down. I went back to Washington to Washington as a correspondent. But <clears throat> I did take on the pro bono activity of being uh, a, uh, the, the uh, newspaper guild, the, the union representative in the Washington Bureau of the Times, which led to a number of uh, results, but uh, in, in terms of the, the, the Times and the Union, but or, or the reporters. But the event that I think um, I remember most in a way was, we were, was this. We were negotiating with the Times and with the fellow who took the job I had turned down across the table from me. Um, and asking for different things for the for the reporters and editors, <clears throat> forgive me. And uh, the uh, the times that I kept saying all night and into the morning into uh, you know three a.m. They didn't have any money. They didn't have any money, and they couldn't give us. They couldn't pay us any more money. And finally, um, I uh, said, look. I understand that your position is you don't have any money and you can't give us any more money, but here's an item that doesn't cost you anything that you should give us and we need. And the item was this, when a reporter wrote a story and the Times changed the story, some editor or editors changed the story, then the reporter should have the right to have his or her byline taken off the piece. And in fact, there's an international treaty about this to which the U.S. is party. Anyway, the Times, to my amazement, said, no, we won't give you that. And I was so taken aback that because it was a non-monetary item, it was the absolute right thing to do by any standard. Certainly, it seemed to me by the Times' standard. And I had, you know, as I mentioned, just recently finished uh, law school, and I... Uh, feigned anger, I suppose, and said, look, uh, if you cannot give us this non-economic item, I'm going to recommend to our team that we strike. And I walked out. And um, about 20 minutes later, the Times negotiator came and they came back in the room, brought us back into the room and said they would give us that item. But the very notion that the paper would change a story and keep the reporter's byline on it when it didn't say what he or she had said was um, troublesome. And I was very glad we won that one, Eric. Where do you find hope for a better future with the US media? Oh, I, I'm not sure. That's for me to say. Um, there are so many different theories as to what will happen with the media in a digital age with multiple channels, many of them completely unreliable, some of them partially unreliable, with journalists um, bred to revere advocacy journalism as opposed to neutral journalism. I don't know where we're going. Uh, I'm hoping that the Times, as uh, an industry leader, if not the industry leader, will find its way back to its traditional path and say that stay there and find that as both the most um, helpful, the fairest, and um, the, in the end, probably the most profitable way for it to roll forward. The very fact that the New York Times had to take, felt obliged to take house ads, ads that paid for itself, of course, and ran on its own behalf in the Times, um, 
saying how attached it was to the truth, I think tells you something. Uh, why would it feel impelled to say that? Well, thank you, Bob. That was an interesting and insightful discussion. And there is so much more that is in the book. I'm very glad your experiences and perspectives and wisdoms are documented for all of us. Thank you, Eric.